Praise the Lord. Amen. Many thanks to our guest choir from Tanzania uh, for singing about the everlasting gospel. Uh, thank you so much for our friends who are following um, around the world via the internet. That is a wonderful song about the everlasting gospel and we are excited that we've been inspired by that song. Uh, we're continuing our study of the Word of God. Um, and as you know, the theme of this year's camp meeting is saved by the grace of God. Saved by the grace of God. Or saved by grace. It is an interesting theme which is inspired by Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, where the Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This fascinating passage of scripture says a whole lot about how we are saved. For instance, we are saved by grace. Saved through faith. Saved as a gift. Saved not of works. Saved for God and saved unto good works. An amazing study, you know, on the book of, uh, I mean, on salvation, uh, uh, miniaturized in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. And so in this series, we have actually looked at contours of saving grace, contours of saving grace. And we considered the God of grace and the grace of God in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. And in our last study, we began our analysis of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10. And we looked at the first few lines, for by grace you have been saved. From the word, that conjunction for, we concluded uh, uh, that it speaks of the purpose for salvation by grace or the purpose of salvation by grace so that God would display us as the trophies of his grace. For by grace, by grace, that expression by grace also, uh, being a dative of means tells us something about the process of our salvation. And so we look at the process of salvation by grace. By grace, you have been saved. You have been saved. And that expression actually uh, uh, suggests that it is in the passive, suggesting that the action of saving is being done on us, is being done, you know, for us. So God is the one who saves. Uh, we make no contribution to our salvation, so we dare not share God's glory. All right? And so we dealt with the faces of salvation because that word, okay, you have been saved is also in the perfect tense, which suggests suggest that an action took place in the past, but it has lasting effect in the present and beyond. And so we look at the faces of salvation by grace. Uh, we are saved, that is justification. We are being saved, that is sanctification, and we will be saved, and that is glorification. We concluded by looking at the word you. For by grace, you have been saved. And looking at that word, you, that uh, uh, pronoun you, we concluded that uh, we are the products of salvation by grace. Praise the name of Jesus. And so we are continuing our study. And today's topic is the conduit of faith. The conduit of of faith and our text is Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 8 Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 8 
And as you flip the pages of your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, permit me to once more affirm my belief in the Bible as the Word of God. Dear friends, I believe the primacy of the Bible, that the Bible is the ultimate authority. If you believe that women can't, let's say amen. I also believe the sufficiency of the Bible, that it is sufficient to make one wise unto salvation. You believe that women can't, let's say amen. And finally, I believe the totality of the Bible, that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the child of God may be thoroughly furnished for all good works. If we believe that, women shout, Amen. So with that conviction, we want to read from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. The Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's where we're going to stop today. Today our study will be based on those two words. Through faith. Through faith. And the topic is the conduit of saving Faith, the conduit of saving faith. Let's ask the Lord to lead us as we study. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study again your wonderful word of life. Your engrafted word that has power to save our souls. Your word which is like hammer that can break even the most stony of hearts. Loving Father, as it has pleased you today to use a frail, a filthy, and a feeble person like me, I do not ask for mighty words of human wisdom to move the audience. Or I ask, O oh Lord, let humanity diminish and let divinity dominate. Speak to us pointedly, powerfully, and personally, in the name of Jesus, let God's people say, Amen. The conduit of saving faith. Our text says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith. Faith is being presented as the channel of our salvation. The apostle says, through faith. What does he mean? That word through is actually dia in the Greek. It is a preposition which serves as a marker by which something is accomplished. It is actually a preposition of means. Paul, therefore, is describing the instrumentality of our faith. And the idea is by means of faith. Faith is the channel through which salvation flows to the sinner from the Savior. Faith is the means, whereas grace is the objective cause or basis of our salvation. Faith, brothers and sisters, through faith is the subjective means by which one is saved. This is very important because salvation that was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, salvation that was purchased by the death of Jesus Christ is universal in its provision. But it is not universal in its application. Salvation is universal in its provision. Salvation has been provided for all. But it is not universal in its application. What I'm saying is that one is not automatically saved because Christ died. No, one is saved when one puts trust in God's gracious provision, which is in Christ Jesus. If that is clear, say amen to God. So faith is the channel. Faith is is the means faith is the instrumentality grace is the source faith is the means and salvation is the result 
Let me say another way. You might say grace is the reservoir, faith is the channel, and salvation is the stream that washes my sins away. The Bible says we are saved through faith. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, faith. What is faith? Saving faith is not the same as self-confidence. Saving faith is not the same as positive mental attitude. Saving faith is not the same as the name it, claim it, prosperity teaching. It's not the same as the blood it, grab it, prosperity teaching. It's not the same. It's just not the same, my dear brothers and sisters, as the popularized, you know, self-confidence and positive mental attitude by Norman Vincent Peer. No, it's not the same. Saving faith is uniquely biblical. And that is why in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to explore with you what biblical faith is. What saving faith is. The first thing we'll look at is the origin of saving faith. What did I say? The origin of saving faith. Notice what the Bible says, the origin of saving faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is the author of our faith. In other words, faith originates not in a fifth for. Faith originates not in a fifth for. In other words, the person who is having faith. Faith doesn't, you know, ultimately originate in the one having faith. The author of faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. If that is clear, say amen. The word author, which is used in Hebrews, can be translated originator. It can be translated inaugurator, leader, pioneer, forerunner. My dear brothers and sisters, he is the author of our faith. Jesus is the originator of our faith. He is the inaugurator or the source or cause of our faith. Hallelujah. Let me take you to the book of Second Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained. The word obtained simply means received like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So this text says, we have obtained. We have received like precious faith. Faith is a gift. Faith is received from the one who originates faith. Faith originates in Christ. Hallelujah, someone. In Christ. Look, uh, Martin Luther. It is Martin Luther who says, God creates faith. In the human heart, the same way that he created the world, he found nothing and created something. Martin Luther also says, no man can give himself faith. Faith is a gift from God. Faith has as its origin Jesus Christ the Lord who woos us unto himself through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The word of God is preached and the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Praise the Lord. So through the ministry of the Holy Spirit sent by Jesus Christ, faith is created in the heart of uh, the one who believes. So we have seen the origin of saving faith. Jesus is the author of our faith. Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. Now let's go to the next point. The object of saving faith. The object of saving faith. On whom is your faith based on whom is your faith anchored? Well, brothers and sisters, the Bible says in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, and Jesus answering, saith unto them, Have faith in God. Have faith 
in God. Also, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, notice what the apostle says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me, and that life which I now live in the flesh, I live in faith. Notice what he says, the faith which is in the Son of God. The faith which is in the Son of God. My brothers and sisters, we are to have faith in God. We are to have faith in Christ. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. But I will put my trust in a God who is my salvation. Brothers and sisters, our faith is to be anchored in Jesus Christ. Christ must be the anchorage of our faith, the foundation of our faith. If that is clear, say amen to God. So, what is the object of our faith? God. God is the object. Our faith is directed to Him, not to government, not to the world system. Not to United Nations, not to church leaders and whatever, not to our affluence and our sophistications and our jobs, our husbands and wives. No, we are to anchor our faith in Jesus Christ. If that is clear, say amen. So we have seen the origin of faith, the object of faith. Now let's go on to the organization of faith. The Bible says we are saved by grace through faith, the channel of faith, the means of faith. So what is the organization of faith? What are the aspects or elements of faith? What is the structure or the arrangement of faith? What are the constituent aspects or constituent levels of saving faith? Oh, my dear brothers and sisters. The Protestant reformers actually recognized that biblical faith has three essential elements. How many elements? Three. Three essential elements. The reformers called those elements notitia, I'm going to explain that, ascensus, and fiducia. I'm going to explain that. Basically, let me just put it in a term that you understand. The first component or the first element is what you call content. Content. The second is what you call consent. Consent. And the third is called commitment. Commitment. I'm going to look at these three. Content consent and commitment and as i look at these three i am going to also take the word faith f-a-i-t-h faith i'm going to use it as an acrostic in order to give us an understanding of what i'm talking about the f is going to be on the con you know a tent and i will take the a and the r under okay a, 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 a consent and the th on the commitment so let's go on what are the uh, the structures of saving faith the constituent atoms of saving faith the first as we said is what come and talk to me is what content notitia it simply means the content of faith the things that you believe the things that you believe Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, what is it that you believe? And so we take the F in faith. The F stands for facts. The facts of the gospel. That Jesus died for our sins. He rose the third day for our justification. He ascended on high. He was coronated or enthroned. He ever lives to make intercession for us. In other words, what is the content of your belief? What is it that you believe? Some believe Jesus did not die. Some believe Jesus was not born. Some believe Jesus was just a masquerade. Some believe he was a lunatic. Some have various beliefs about this Jesus. But what is the content of your belief? 
Isaiah may have meant this when he said in Isaiah 53, Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? There's somebody who said, wait a minute. So what is the report? What is the report? Well, if you come down to verses 3 to 5, he said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement that should have brought us peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. The content of the Christian faith is the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension of Jesus Christ, and his heavenly, high priestly ministry on our behalf. The facts of the gospel. That Jesus died for our sins. That he was raised the third day for our justification. That is the fact of the gospel. Those are the basic fundamentals, I should say, of the Christian faith. Those are the basics on which we stand so, the F stands for facts under content. And then we go on to the next one, which is consent. The reformers call that a census. It is actually the conviction that the content is correct. Are you there with me? This one, consent, is the conviction that the content is correct. So, for instance, you say Jesus died for our sins. He was resurrected or he, he was raised the third day for our justification. He, he ascended on high and he ever lives to make intercession for us. Well, okay, I believe it. Are you done with me, everyone? So, this has to do with two things. It is what you call mental ascent. Mental ascent. It is an agreement that is the A in faith. The A in faith stands for agreement. It means that I agree with the facts of the gospel. I agree that Jesus died for my sins. I agree that he was raised the third day for my justification. I agree that he ascended on high. I agree that he is interceding for me. This is agreement. Because it is one thing to know the truth of the gospel and it's another thing altogether to agree with it. Are you there with me, brothers and sisters? So, the, the next one after agreement is internalization. That is the I in faith. You agree and you internalize what you have agreed upon, what you have accepted. It is the inner desire of a believer to accept and to apply the truth of the gospel to his or her own life. You internalize the word of God. You internalize the truth of God's word. And this will eventually, you know, result in obedience and submission and so on. Then we go to the last component of saving faith, the component of commitment. What is the first one? Content. What is the second? Consent. And what is the next one? Commitment. Commitment, the reformers call that, okay, fiducia. It refers to personal trust and reliance. Personal trust and reliance. Dear brothers and sisters, the F in faith is facts. The A in faith is agreement. The R in faith is internalization. And then we go to the next two on the commitment. And the first of those two is called trust. Trust. Commitment means unreserved confidence in God. That he will keep his promises. That he will do what he says he will do. That he is a trustworthy God who can be trusted by you. It is actually relying on God. Trust is standing on the promises of Christ, my King. Trust is depending wholly on the God of heaven. And in addition to trust, my dear brothers and sisters, we have the H in faith, which is hope. Hope. Hope is where you are sure that God will fulfill his promises. You are sure that even though you have not seen it, 
God is going to do it. Oh, my friends, you believe in a God who called those things which were not as though they were. Praise the Lord. So, the three constituent elements or constituent components of saving faith are, number one, content. You have to know the basic facts of the gospel. And you get to know those one through the preaching of the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Paul says, how will they hear if there is not a preacher? Are you there with me? So there you are. The first is the content. That is the first constituent component. The second is what? Consent. Meaning that, oh, I've heard that Jesus died and so on. I agree. I believe it. And the last element is what? Commitment. You need to know that commitment, the order there is actually, uh, let's say, sequential. This commitment is like the, 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 it, is, it is the crescendo in the development of faith. It is the crescendo in the development of faith. In other words, when you look at the New Testament, when the Bible talks about faith, in most cases, it is actually about commitment. When the Bible talks about believe, it is actually looking at commitment. As a matter of fact, the word believe is from the, the Greek word, and the word commitment from the Greek word, that's basically the same. The very same word is used in the Greek for believe and for commitment. The word commit is the very same word for believe as you study the word of God. What it means is that saving faith is not head knowledge. It's not just content, cognitive. No, it is not just mental conviction or mental assent. No, it is not just intellectual assent. No. Saving faith is believing in Jesus, who and what he is, that he is the Savior, but not just the Savior, he is the Lord. Many want to get a Jesus who is only a Savior to them. But he's not just Savior, he is Lord. And being our Lord requires that we submit to him, that we surrender ourselves to him. My dear brothers and sisters, saving faith is actually commitment. Saving faith is the commitment of a man's total being and life to Jesus Christ. That is why saving faith is the same as giving my life to Jesus. Have you heard that before? When they say, come and give your life to Jesus, it is the same as believing Jesus. It is the same as receiving Jesus. It is surrendering one's whole being to Jesus. Well, my dear friends, I think I can illustrate this with this uh, interesting uh, illustration. This is one of my most favorite illustrations about how one can have faith in God. It is a true story about Anne Seward, a resident of Portland, Oregon. Okay, she was asked to Costa to go and, you know, uh, carry on a particular drama or play with a high wire artist. A high wire artist is somebody who walks on wires from one tall building to another tall building. Sometimes they go over waters. High wire artist. His name, Philip Petit. Philip Petit. And at the opening of the Poland Center for that performing act, they were to carry on this particular performance. Intrigued by the opportunity, this woman, uh, by the name of Anne Seward, actually responded. She said, I would like to meet this man and see if I trust him. I would like to meet this man and see if I trust him. Her stage will be on an 80-foot wire. 80 foot wire. Oh, brothers and sisters, this was a serious business. It was to be between two theater buildings, two theater buildings. Okay, you have the theater building and also the Arling Street Stars, okay, concert hall. They were to walk between those two buildings. And so on August 31st, 1987, the 91 pound Seward 
placed her life in the hands of this high wire artist and was carried on his back while he performed high above the street. She was on his back as he was walking on the wire. She said that her performance had a lesson for those who witnessed it. She said, I think that one of the most beautiful things about the performance was that it took a lot of trust, absolute trust, to do that. The truth is that, brothers and sisters, many of those who witnessed the performance, they believed believed that Petit actually could successfully complete the performance with someone on his back. They all believed it, but no one risked his or her life to get on his back. No one risked his or her life to get on his back. Faith is getting on God's back as he goes through hot waters and tough times. Faith is holding on to the unchanging hands of God. Faith is surrendering your life to the God of heaven. If that is clear, say amen. Faith, my dear brothers and sisters, is not just head knowledge. No, it is the response of a heart to the person of Jesus Christ. And you are basically saying, I trust your redeeming work to deliver me from sin and carry me safely to heaven. Faith is staying on the back of Jesus from modernity, from earth to eternity. Faith is holding on to the promises of God. Faith is standing on the promises of God. Faith is being carried by Jesus. That is faith, brothers and sisters. We confuse faith a whole lot. Faith is not just mental assent. In fact, as a matter of fact, Martin Luther, this great Protestant reformer, actually says this about faith. He gave two types of faith. One of them, he says, is called, is called acquired faith. And the other is called true faith. Notice what he says, Martin Luther. He says, acquired faith has as the end or use of Christ's passion mere speculation. Then he says, true faith has as the end and use of Christ's passion life and salvation. True faith with arms outstretched joyfully embraces the Son of God giving for it and says, He is my beloved and I am His. True faith is a relationship with Jesus. True faith is knowing Jesus relationally. Well, Ellen White picked on Martin Luther's statement and said almost the same thing. Notice what Ellen White says. She says, there are thousands who believe in the gospel and in Jesus Christ as the world's redeemer, but they are not saved by that faith. Did you get that? She said they believe in the gospel of Jesus. They believe Jesus is the word redeemer, but they are not saved by that faith. She says this is only an ascent of their judgment to that which is a fact. It is only a cognitive ascent. It is only a mental ascent. They only agree with the facts of the gospel, my dear brothers and sisters. Notice what she also says. She called that kind of faith general faith. Is it possible some of us will be in church and we have general faith? And we think we are saved? She said thousands have general faith. They think they are saved. She says this is general faith. And she contrasts that faith with real faith. Notice what she says. Real faith is a faith that accomplishes its work for the receiver. A faith in the atoning sacrifice. A faith that works by love and purifies the soul. That is true faith. Well, that is not all. She further clarified this faith with these words. She says, the moment true faith in the merits of the costly atoning sacrifice is exercised. Claiming Christ as a personal savior. That moment... The sinner is justified before God because he is pardoned. True faith 
is saving faith. Real faith is saving faith. Real faith is saving faith. And if you exercise such a faith, trust, surrender, commitment to the God of heaven, that very moment Ellen White says, you are justified because you are pardoned. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. So we go to the next part of our talk as we conclude. The first point is the author or the origin of saving faith. Who is the author of our faith? Then the next point is the object of saving faith. Who is the object of our faith? Come on, talk to me. Who is the object of our faith? Jesus. And then the third point is the organization of saving faith. Saving faith has three constituent components. And they are content and consent and commitment. And when the Bible says believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, it means commit your life to Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters, let's close by looking at the outcome of saving faith. Ellie already started telling us the point. She says the moment you have that kind of faith in Jesus, you are justified before God because you are pardoned. So what is the outcome? If you have such a faith in God, what would be the result? Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Romans 5, 1, the Bible says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the first thing you get when you truly exercise faith in God is justification. If you exercise faith in God, you are saved through that faith. By means of that faith, you are justified by God. Justification is a forensic, a Jewish prudential declaration of holiness on account of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. In justification, God says, you are declared righteous. I thought God's people would shout a louder amen than that. The Bible says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He believed and God deposited it in his account as righteousness. Hallelujah. God imputed righteousness to him. Justification is imputed righteousness. Justification is the certification that all the penalties of sins have been taken away from over your head. You are therefore now no longer condemned. Justification is actually the certificate that you have been reconciled with God. Justification is the certificate that you will be sanctified by God. Justification is the certificate that you will be glorified by God. If that is clear, say amen to God. So the first benefit of saving faith, if you have faith in God today, as you are following via the internet or you are sitting in this audience today, if you truly commit your life to Jesus, you truly give your life to Jesus, he will justify you. That is not all. In Romans 5, verse 1, he also says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. The second thing you get if you have faith in God, if you exercise faith in God, is reconciliation. You get peace with God through the substitution and the propitiation of Jesus Christ. Jesus becomes your substitute before God, meaning that his death is given to your account and your unrighteousness is laid upon him. Therefore, you have paid through Christ the penalty of sin and now you take his righteousness. God made him sin for you. Who knew no sin that you and I may become the righteousness of God through him. If that is clear, say amen. Dear brothers and sisters, Jesus is not just our substitute. As our substitute, he is our propitiation. Propitiation means the one who died in order to appease the wrath of God. 
If you study the book of, uh, I think it's the book of Proverbs, okay, the Bible actually says that God is angry with the wicked every day. The Bible also says in Proverbs that God hates, you mentioned certain evil. But when you are justified, God is no longer angry with you. If that is clear, say amen. Jesus has become our propitiation. He has become the one who appeases the wrath of God on our behalf. If that is clear, say amen to God. You are reconciled to God. If you exercise your faith in God today, there is another thing that you get. You get sanctification. Brothers and sisters, the Bible also says in verse 2 of Romans chapter 5, the Bible says, Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice. The Bible says we have access. Access is a powerful word. To have access means to actually, uh, 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 let me say, access the presence of God. It is actually being able to enter into God's presence. Access gives the idea of the high priest who once in a year entered into the most holy place. The most holy place had the Ark of the Covenant that had on it what you call the mercy seat. The mercy seat is what you call the throne of grace. Now the Bible says that now we have access into this grace. We can now boldly come before the throne of grace that we may obtain help in time of need. You don't need a high priest. That is why you don't need to be a Christians who have pastors. Some charismatic guys are saying, I am your spiritual covering. I am the one who goes before God for you. You go to praying mothers and praying fathers and praying sisters. You don't need them. That is the Protestant way of repeating the Catholic doctrine of the priesthood. In the New Testament, all believers are priests. For we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We all have access to the presence of God. We can all boldly come. You come without anyone iota or shame because he is your father. Because he is your brother. So if you exercise faith in God, not only will you be justified, you will be reconciled. Not only will you be reconciled, you will be sanctified. And as you conclude, my brothers and sisters, if you exercise faith in God, there is another thing you will get. The Bible says, this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That is glorification. Hallelujah. If you exercise faith in God, you will be glorified. You will have access to that hope of the glory of God. The writer says, Christ in you is what? Hope. Of glory. Are you there with me? I am 100% optimistic that I am going to heaven. Are you there with me? Not because of any work of righteousness I have done, but because of his blood that was shed for me. I'm not going to the judgment with fear, I'm not going to the judgment with fumbling. I'm not going to the judgment feeling afraid. No, I have the verdict in my back pocket. You say, preacher, what is the verdict? Well, Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, condemnation is the opposite of justification. When you go to court, you are either condemned or justified. You are either acquitted or declared guilty. And the Bible already says right now, as you stand or sit and as I stand, we have a verdict of not guilty. I'm not going to the court for verdict. I already have the verdict. I am going to the court for vindication. I'm going to the court for vindication. I'm going to the court for vindication. I'm going to stand before a God. I'm going to stand before the God of the universe. 
who will before the entire intelligent universe say, my dear son, because you are in Christ, I see you just as you have never seen. You know, sometimes we're fretting ourselves. The Bible says, without holiness, no man can see God. You all know that, right? I am not going to God's office with my holiness. It is like filter rag before him. I'm going to God's office with Yahweh Sekeno. The Lord, our righteousness. I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ in me. And every day after imputing his righteousness, he is imparting his righteousness. He is transforming my life, my mind, my character, my behavior to that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I see him as he is on that great waking up morning, on that great glorious resurrection day, the Bible says we will be like him. Like him. Like him. Now, dear brothers and sisters, as we close, when the reformers said sola fide, or faith alone as our only instrument, they were actually reacting to the Roman Catholic's error. Roman Catholic taught that faith plus work equals salvation. The reformer said, no, it is faith alone in the soul. I mean, I wish it's the sole instrument or the sole instrumental cause of our salvation. So that I can say today before all of you, my faith has found a resting place. Not in a man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he for me will plead. <laughs> he for me will plead. Therefore, I need no other evidence. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. Oh, brothers and sisters, you probably have heard about the man Martin Luther. In the 16th century, he was a young man who studied to become a lawyer. And as part of his studies, he actually learned about the law of God. And since he studied the demands of the law of God, he lay with dread and fear and guilt because he knew that he could never meet the righteous demands of the law of God. In his fear of wrath, he sought to appease God by giving up his desire to become a lawyer, to rather become a monk. This man became a monk, and as a monk, he subjected himself to many discomforts. He tried to punish himself in order to please God. He practiced penance. He practiced indulgences. He struggled daily with the question of how can a holy God punish him for his sin that he had committed? And one day, brothers and sisters, as Martin Luther was reading his New Testament, he came across Romans chapter 1 verse 7. And he discovered the lines, the just shall live by faith. And Martin Luther said, that very day, the doors of paradise swung open. That very day, the doors of paradise swung open. And on the 31st of October, 1517, Martin Luther, about 500, more than 500 years ago, Martin Luther wrote 95 theses and he nailed them on the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And that became the spark that brought about the Protestant Reformation. But this man, Martin Luther, one day he had a dream after he discovered the doctrine of justification by faith. And in his dream, Satan appeared to him. And Satan said, Martin Luther, you are a cheat. You can lie. You have unclean thoughts. Martin Luther, you have neglected your duties. You have wasted time. You have cheated. You have lied. You have unclean thoughts. And Martin Luther said, well, I did all those things. You are right. But the devil was holding his hand 
with those allegations, with those accusations, with a paper on the wall. And Martin Luther said to the devil, devil, remove your hand. Devil, move your hand. Satan did not want to move his hand. He said, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, take away your hand. And the devil removed his hand, and that accusation dropped. And what was raging? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses Martin Luther from all his sins. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. We are free. Praise the Lord, we are free. No longer bound, no more chains holding us. Our souls are resting. Oh, what a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We are free. So Martin Luther says, the doctrine of justification by faith is the article upon which the church stands or falls. And Ellen White seems to be following Martin Luther a whole lot. Or they are basically, you know, thinking the same thing because they are inspired by one source, the Holy Spirit. Notice what Ellen White says. She says, through all the ages, the great truth of justification by faith has stood as a mighty beacon to guide repentant sinners into the way of life. Hallelujah! That is the message for our time, my dear brothers and sisters. Anyone says this present message, justification by faith, is a message from God. It bears the divine credential for its fruit is unto holiness. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, anyone says the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. The sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the shouting. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in the obedience to all the commandments of God. She said many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into the, his hand that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message. Hallelujah! Third angel's message. The mission of the SDA church is to preach the three angels' messages. And Ellen White says, the third angels' message is justification by faith. Are you there with me? It is the third angels' message, which is to be proclaimed with a what kind of voice? Loud voice. And attended with the outpouring of the Spirit in a large measure. Ellen White says, several people have written to me. Inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered. Let us read her answer together. Ready, go. It is the third angel's message in verity. Hallelujah. That is the message, my brothers and sisters. Justification by faith. All eyes closed. As we ask the song leaders... To lead us as we sing, my faith has found a resting place. You want to also stand in this place quietly. Please stand. Please stand. Song leaders, my faith has found a resting place. Not in the man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he for me will plead. I need no other evidence. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. Let us sing that song like we mean it with all our hearts. My faith has found. Five to three, let us sing. 
My faith has found a resting place, not in a man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he for me will please. I need no other evidence. I need sing no that song with all your heart, people. Evidence. Yes, sing it like you mean it. It is enough it is that Jesus died, that Jesus died and rose again. And rose again for enough me. for me that Jesus saves. Enough for me that Jesus this ends saves. my fear and doubt. This ends my fear and a doubt. sinful soul I come to him. A sinful soul. I come he will to not cast him. me out. He will not cast me. Now sing that uh, chorus of all your heart. I need no other evidence. I need no other, I need no other plea. I need, need no other plea. No it is enough that Jesus died. It is enough that Jesus died. And rose again for me. My soul is resting. My soul as we is sing that stanza. As we sing that stanza. I'm not going to take it for granted that some of us may only have cognitive faith or general faith or acquired faith. Some of us have not committed our lives to Jesus. We have not totally surrendered ourselves to Jesus. At that moment, my dear brothers and sisters, if you want to commit yourself to Jesus, you want to surrender your life to Jesus, you want to give yourself wholly to Him, why don't you lift up your hand wherever you are? You want to be His all together. Lift up your hand wherever you are. You say, I surrender myself to you wholly. I commit myself to Jesus today. Wholly, completely. If that is a commitment, lift up your hand. All eyes closed. All heads bowed. You say, Lord, I totally surrender to you. I give my life to you this moment. I commit myself to you this moment. If you're making that commitment, lift up your hand. Wherever you are, I want to pray with you. Is there someone, God bless you, my friend, who is saying, Lord, I commit myself to you. I dedicate my life to you. Oh, God, I present my body to you as a living sacrifice. Lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. God bless you. Lift up your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Lift up your hand. Just before we pray, lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. Hallelujah. Lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. You are committing yourself to Jesus wholly, completely. Lift up your hand as we pray. Now all eyes closed and all, all heads bow. Now you got to lift your hand higher than that. There's a serious business higher than that. Higher than that. Hallelujah. Now listen to me. This is a sign of surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Commitment of ourselves to him. And yes, what I want you to do. As all eyes are closed, all heads are bowed. With your hands lifted up. I want you to take a step of faith. Come right up here. Just step forward. Walk to me right now. Let's pray together. Walk to me. We are going to kneel down here and pray. Come over. If your hand is up, I'm asking you to come. Just come forward. Come forward. If your hand is up, just come forward. God bless you. If you have your hand up, take a step of faith. God bless you, brother. Just come forward. Come forward. We don't have time. Come quickly. Come quickly. If your hand is up, I'm asking you to come. Let us kneel down and pray today, committing our lives to Jesus. God bless you, my friends. God bless you. Come on, come on, come on. Come up here. Come up here. God bless you. Come up here. We're going to pray together. We're going to commit ourselves to the Lord. If you're following via the internet. You want to surrender your life to Jesus as well. You can do so wherever you are. If you're not incapacitated following via the internet. You don't have challenges and you can kneel down. We want you to do the same. As we surrender our lives to Jesus this moment. On the basis of the fact that Jesus died and rose again for us. That's the foundation of our faith. Is there somebody else who's coming? Come, 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 come up here. Come on. As God calling you to himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to call Pastor Robert. 
Pastor Robert, to come and offer prayer as we all kneel down. Pastor and I are going to kneel along with you as we pray a prayer of surrender, total commitment of ourselves to Jesus. Let us pray that prayer with our pastor. Kind and loving Father in, hef in heaven, uh, we bow our heads before you in contrition. We recognize our in inadequacy before you. The enemy might have succeeded to beat us down such that we strayed away from you. But now, Heavenly Father, through your servant, through your man's servant, we have heard your voice. You've spoken to us through your word. You've brought us your grace and your righteousness through the person of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, accept us back again into your fold. May you encompass us round with your protection, even the protection of the most powerful angels of heaven. May you fill us again with your spirit that as we begin this journey of faith, Heavenly Father, we may never look back. Remember us and may you write our names in the book of life. That Heavenly Father, as you are revealed in the clouds of heaven, all of us will shout a hallelujah as we ascend to meet you in the skies. Continue to hold us together with your, love, with your love. May we find favor in your eyes, always, Heavenly Father. Continue to abide with us through your bonds of love, now and forevermore, in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. What a blessing we've had from our pastor, Lady of Hope, and also the children ministry, and also from Jiro is the choir. By this point in time, I'd like to ask us to rise up with the theme song, Kindly Acquire.